Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Verduco. I'm the manager of career programs at WIF. Uh, welcome to everyone watching on Zoom and on Facebook Live. So we are streaming in uh, double platforms today. Uh, we have an incredible event. The women of late night, Amber Ruffin, Jenny Hagel, Ali Ford, Dina, Dina Guzowski, and moderated by Janelle Riley. Uh, before I introduce Janelle, a quick housekeeping note. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end. We want to hear from all of you. Um, if you are on the Zoom with us, please use the Q&A function that is at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you are on Facebook uh, Live, you can go ahead and ask your question in the Facebook chat. Um, you are all welcome to use that chat function if you are in Zoom, but just know if you actually want to ask a question of our panelists, please use that Q&A Q function. Uh, so, to introduce our moderator, Janelle Riley is the Deputy Awards and Features Editor at Variety. She has received two Emmy Awards for her work on Variety PBS's Actors on Actor series. She penned the award-winning plays A Kind of Love Story and Jane Austen's Emma Frankenstein, and the short films Crazy Love and Warning Label, starring Karen Gillian. She regularly hosts Q&As on SAG Actors Foundation Channel. Welcome, Janelle. Thank you. That was so nice. You, you wasted too much time on my resume, though, because we have such an impressive lineup here today. Um, so I want to get right to it. We have four funny and fabulous women. They're all Emmy nominees this year for their work on Late Night with Smyers. Please welcome Amber Ruffin, Jenny Hangel, Ali Horde, and Dina Gazowski. Uh, thank you so much for being here, um, and thank you for making us laugh during unprecedented times. <laughs> I always like to go back to the beginning and ask, um, when did you first realize that you could have a career in comedy? Did you always know you were funny? Did you start as a writer or as a comic? And were there funny women you could look up to um, and, and say like, you know, I could do that maybe. <laughs> you're also polite. Amber, let's start with you. <laughs> oh, Amber, you're on mute. <laughs> My voice. <laughs> My voice. Um, I started out as an improviser in Chicago, where um, that was really the only way you did comedy. Like, I guess there were stand-ups. I didn't see them. None of them were my little buddies or anything. And I guess there were people who just wrote comedy, but I didn't know that was a thing until almost I got this job. I just thought everyone was an improviser who also wrote comedy. I thought that was everyone. I didn't know some people were like, I don't ever want to perform. I just want to sit down and write. They're crazy. <laughs> Did you do like improv training, like Second City or any of those Second institutions? City? Oh, really? I did IO. I did Boom Chicago. I did them all, baby, except for comedy sports. I auditioned and I didn't make it. No, that's Lord. Not true. I did not make it in the comedy sports. That's <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is unbelievable. Because <laughs> you got such a foul mouth, right? Yeah, I was always getting the brown paper bag foul. Is that what it is? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, comedy sports is like clean comedy, right? It's yeah. supposed to be very family oriented. Yeah. Yeah, but probably wasn't a good fit for you then. <laughs> um, Allie, what about for you? Um, I would say that like growing up, I was like a theater kid. And to me, the only representations of like women having comedy careers was sort of like SNL or Mad TV. That to me was all I knew about as far as having that career. And I wasn't so sure I wanted to go all in on acting. I, I wanted to be a comedy writer. So it wasn't until I moved out to LA and started doing UCB and then I worked at Funny or Die and suddenly like online comedy became an option, which, you know, people segued that into a TV career. So it kind of seemed like the world opened up when I graduated college and things moved online, really. It just seemed like more accessible and um, you could put your own work up online. So that's sort of when I got introduced to the community and it all sort of expanded from there. And Jenny, for you, I, be I believe you started as a performer as well. I did, yeah. I I did um, improv in college, like I think, and everybody who went to college in the '90s was required to do. Um, and uh, but I, you know, I came. I grew up in the D.C. suburbs, where like pretty much everybody's parents work in like government or you know are in the military, have some kind of like very straight laced job. And then in my junior year, 
I mean, I like was doing improv and thought I'd grow up and have like a normal grown up job. And then my junior year in college, Second City, that their touring company came and performed at my college. And I can't explain like when I saw them, I just remember like 10 minutes in the show, I felt like my scalp was on fire and I just felt like my whole body was vibrating. And I was like, what is this? And as soon as the lights came up, cause I just had no idea. I was like, this is a job someone can have. And then I remember as soon as the lights came up, my roommate turned to me and she was like, you need to do that. That's what you need to do. And then I just, for the rest of college spent like the next year and a half trying to figure out like, this is also like pre Google trying to figure out like, okay, how do you become a person who has that job? And then from there, I think like Ali and Amber were saying, once you get into the world, then the next steps start to kind of reveal themselves. And, and Dina, I, I'm so interested in your story because you, I know you as a journalist, you made documentaries like Death and Dishonor, Crisis at the VA, things that, that don't seem to lend themselves to a comedy career. Um, when did that shift kind of happen? Well, I was like opioids, private prisons, veterans issues. So naturally I felt like the next career move should be comedy. Um, but Jenny was saying like, I had like a, a grown up job and that's why I was so happy to get this one. Um, and uh, so it was an interesting transition and I learned a lot and still in the process of learning a lot on the job um, from these women, especially. Um, so it was, it was an interesting transition and um, I was just sort of watching 2015 and 2016 where journalism was turning into this weird sport of like, let's broadcast empty podiums and all the rallies and like, Every, you know it probably better than anybody. And so I was just so disillusioned with what was happening. And I didn't want to pretend like this was a serious thing and this was a serious person. Um, and so I was so eager to like make that change. Did you have any kind of a comedy background prior to that? I mean, were you someone who grew up being told they were funny? Yeah, and then I realized, mm, I don't know, once I got this job um, <laughs> being around these people, I'm like, those people lied. Um, but uh, yeah, but the thing is that like I grew up in um, an immigrant household where like you couldn't tell your parents you wanted to do comedy or theater or arts because that was like, aha, that was not something you could actually do. So I felt like journalism was the closest I could come to not completely disappointing them because you were supposed to be like a lawyer or a doctor or do finance and this certainly wasn't for me. So um, yeah. I'm sort of curious about that for the rest of you. How did your families feel when you said, I want to go into a career in comedy? I know lots of actors and, and performers um, get a little pushback on that, but, um, or was that ever a discussion you had? I'm the youngest of five, so my parents don't care what I do. <laughs> yeah, same, youngest of three, did not care. <laughs> I'm the opposite, I'm the oldest. My mom is still very much hoping that I go to law school or do something normal. She's still not sold on this. <laughs> well, um, in fairness to your mom, um, there, there's cause for concern. Late night shows in the past haven't necessarily been known for being open to having women on staff. Um, I could quote the uh, staggering statistics, but I think something that's so great about Seth Meyers' show specifically is, is the diversity um, all the way around. But when the job did come to you, what, what, interested you being in, what interested you in being a part of the show? And did you have any reservations? Oh, wow, that's an interesting question. I have to say, I feel like whenever you do a panel, there's always like, you're like, okay, this question again. And that is a question I've never heard. That's so really? interesting. It's so interesting. Um, yeah, I didn't, partly because I thought the show was so great and I thought it was such a cool mix of like smart and silly. I really, cause I remember like the week that I interviewed, there was like a closer look was on the air a lot, but then also there was like a monologue joke about a man who had a buffalo for a head for a head. And I just love that I was like, oh, there's a show that's doing both of those things the same week. Um, so I didn't, and then also I knew Amber personally and I knew she was having a good experience. So I think both on camera, it seemed like a really smart and interesting place to be. And then I just knew that people were having a good time there. But I can't speak for everybody, but that was how I felt going in. Amber, you've been with the show from the beginning. I mean, uh, what were your initial thoughts? I thought, great. You knew <laughs> where I was. I was at a theater with you. If at night and then during the day I was nannying a little baby when I got this job so I was like yeah I'll, I'll take it <laughs> <laughs> and you knew Seth right you guys go back quite a ways I know Seth from Boom Chicago a comedy theater in Amsterdam and he is an uh alum of it I don't know probably like seven years before me I don't know a million years before me how old is Seth 50 
So, so 20 years before me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, he had seen me perform. So he asked me if I wanted a job, but I got this job right after I had auditioned for SNL. So I think that's how I got the job. Who knows? Right. Your, but, your SNL audition actually kind of led to this job in, in a way, which is, is the nice story about not getting a job. Yeah, because Lord like, knows I was going to die. When they told me I didn't get SNL, I was like, are you sure? <laughs> 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 I was so convinced. Uh, yeah. And now, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't you share like a floor with Saturday Night Live? Yeah, we're at the studio next door. <laughs> so you can let them see what they missed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You missed out on all of this, baby. <laughs> They're fine. <laughs> uh, Ali and Dina, what about for you? You two, what, uh, what interested you in being a part of the program? Well, they offered me a job, which was huge. That was yep. a big... <laughs> That was a big plus for me at the time because I had never been professionally hired to write for TV before. Um, but it was kind of just like uh, kismet for me because the the tone of the show and the sense of humor, like Jenny was saying, very much was my sensibility. And um, I mean, it's it's just a testament that like no one ever leaves the show. Like Seth can't get any writers to leave. So, you know, we kind of just like won the jackpot with this job. So. Um, that was my main reason for taking the job is the offer. <laughs> Dina, similar for you? Yeah, I felt like I didn't have like time to have reservations, if that makes sense, because um, I was convinced that I wouldn't get the job because when I uh, met with Seth and the head writer, I was like talking about how, well, you know, when Hillary becomes president, when Hillary becomes president, because it was right after the election. So I was like predicating my entire cell to work on the show based on that, because I didn't think in a million years uh, what happened would happen and so um, so I was just convinced like oh you know I, I definitely didn't get this job so it was so shocking and then I just kind of you know of course. <laughs> Were you like pitching your comedy based on when Hillary was president with what the comedy would be like? Yeah and where to mine for the stories and how to get the stories because I felt like Seth had this like amazing momentum what everyone was saying which is combining politics and humor and basically everything and kind of melding it together um, and producing something really great. So I was saying, here's where I can find the stories to keep kind of the momentum going when Hillary's president. And then you had to pivot, I guess. Oh, yeah, we all did. I think that, um, yeah. I think I'm still pivoting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Ali, you, you mentioned that no one ever wants to leave and I, uh, IndieWire called you the happiest writing staff on television. Um, what is the atmosphere like in the writer's room? I, I, I think that it's, it's helpful to feel safe to fail, which is something I know they teach in improv also, but also how does having all these diverse voices there help? I mean, it's great. I think we're one of the few late night rooms where all the writers are in one room. Is that correct, guys? I think that's, um, so it's literally just like this bullpen room and we're all around each other. And it's great for comedy because we're just constantly bouncing ideas off each other. We're sort of taking inside jokes and turning them into characters and sketches. And um, I mean, and granted, you have to have a pair of noise canceling headphones, though, because people do not shut up ever. Um, <laughs> but you learn to work with it. And it's just sort of like we've all been on the staff together for so many years. It just feels like you're working with all of your brothers and sisters at this point. And um, it's so fun when new people do come into the room because you're, you're getting a whole new life story, new viewpoint, new person to tease. And they just bring a whole other different energy into the room. And um, it's just, everyone's really great. Everyone's very friendly and outgoing. And it's, I don't know, I, I'll kick it to somebody else, but it's just like, it's been such a spoiling experience of writing, I think. Uh, I don't think every show is like this. So that's, that's my two cents. I think another thing that I really love about the room is that it's incredibly positive. And I don't mean to sound Pollyanna about it, but, but, but the, an inherent part of, of writing for late night is getting things rejected because you pitch so many things all the time that the vast majority of things that yeah, things that you come up with are rejected if you're a monologue writer you probably have a hundred jokes rejected a day if you write sketch like most of your sketches are rejected and I feel like it's a room where it's very safe to pitch things and nobody acts like you're a dummy because you pitched something that didn't get chosen and in a weird way too I think because we all get along so well we really celebrate each other's failures like, um, I remember one time, uh, one of the writers, one of our fellow writers, Ian, wrote this whole song, and it got cut, and then he turned it in on paper, and then he came back to the writer's room, and he goes, you guys want to hear it? 
And we were like, yeah. And we all, even though it was a, a failed song, we all stopped what we were doing, turned around in our chairs and listened. And he sang a song. And then we were all like, that's great. Even though it had already been thrown in the trash. It was um, great. It was great. great. And Allie had a trophy custom made. This was the cool thing. Allie ordered a custom trophy that we hand around the room and give to people if a thing that they pitch goes all the way to rehearsal and then gets cut. And then that person gets to have it on their desk until the next person fails. And then that person gets, and it's just like such a lovely, I mean, it's silly, but it's also a really important, lovely energy because it gives, makes people, I think it helps make me, I know, brave enough to try things. Cause I know that there won't be so weird social consequences for failing. Yeah, you don't want to attach negativity to failure. If you have the whole room laugh at your failures with you, it just, you know, you dust off your shoulder a little easier. Is it possible for any of those things that get cut to end up on the show down the line or are you just too timely and topical for it to come back? Like, I really want to hear this song now that you've mentioned it. <laughs> Jenny's going to resurrect this song. I don't even remember what it was about, but I just remember Ian singing his little heart out and I even took a picture because he had this great earnest face on he's reading off the paper oh oh it was about mary berry was it no, it wasn't mary berry christmas mary was berry it? was aired right he, he mary berry christmas aired. Oh, i forgot how many songs he writes <laughs> it probably are about food though what is yeah it's usually about food <laughs> oh. um, um I, I would say though to answer your question we do move pretty quickly so things you know, don't get picked. Um, there's a chance they'll they'll say something like send it to digital and maybe it can be repurposed for Instagram or some of the other uh, platforms. But for the most part, I mean, the show moves pretty quickly. So uh, you got to keep chugging along and, you know, not be precious about how full your trash can gets at the end of the day. <laughs> I call it Ian. He'll tell us soon. Okay. Oh, you texted him? Okay. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I forgot you're not just writing for a show. You also have, you know, a digital component. There's TV now is, is everywhere and there, there's, there's so many different parts. So I'm sort of curious how the writing room works. Do you meet every day to pitch ideas? Do you develop specific things for specific guests? And how does something sort of take on a life of its own? Like Amber and Jenny, you do jokes Seth can't tell. I, I'm wondering if that just came about organically one day when like he realized there were jokes that he probably shouldn't tell. I mean, I know. It, jokes Seth can't tell was Jenny's idea. But it, it really truly came from me having written a bunch of lesbian jokes that I of course thought was hilarious, more hilarious. And then I, the head writer very politely casually mentioned like, hey, we can't use any of those. And I was like, oh, right, that would look bad if Seth was dumping on lesbians. Um, and then I think it just, like I said off offhandedly to Amber, like, hey, what if we like did this thing? And, but I think in the spirit of kind of what we're all talking about, we have a sketch due every week by a certain time. And then we read them all. It used to be on Thursday mornings. Um, now we do like a Zoom every Friday. But it was like kind of in the spirit of, like, I didn't think anything more or less of that sketch than any other sketch I've written. It was just, hey, there's a sketch due this week, like there is every week, let's crank it out and do our best. And then we assume it will get rejected and we'll just try again next week. <laughs> what is it like in those meetings? I mean, is it just everybody pitching ideas? Do you try to act them out? Or you know, do you suggest things like if you know if a guest is coming on the show, if, if, if you know they're open to, to play around? Um, yeah, so we have in this in this like sketch meeting, we read through everyone's sketches. It's a table read. Um, and so you assign roles and you know, if you have funny accents or something like that, maybe you send it the day before and have them read through so they become familiar with the character you're asking them to portray. We're very serious actors. We take it very deeply seriously. <laughs> um, and then we read it and you know, usually Seth makes fun of us while reading our sketch and <laughs> But we all just like, you know, support each other and laugh. And usually it's silly. Sometimes people just submit sketches just to be a jerk about something, which is also really? very fun. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 a fun way to kind of get the family together once a week, especially now that, you know, during quarantine and see each other's faces and, you know, pitch silly things that we can pull off remotely uh, nowadays, obviously. But um, yeah, sketch reads like a fun family get together every week. I mean, you've mentioned quarantine and we are in this, you know, strange time with the pandemic and lockdown. Um, but even before that, I think there were some people who wondered if we could still find ways to laugh at the state of the world. Um, I'm sort of curious how you take current events and turn them into comedy, because in theory, a worldwide pandemic isn't funny, but you're able to mine 
comedy from dire situations. Um, I'm sort of curious how you approach that. And is there anything you wouldn't tell a joke about? I think we approach it from, well, I approach it from, you know, a place where I'm like, I feel sad and I feel like laughing. How can I turn the sad thing into something I will laugh about? Cause it's depressing. So, but also that's naturally what you would do. Like, you know how you get dumped by your little boyfriend, then you call all your friends and then you hang out, you're sad, you're so sad. And then like two hours into it, you're like, his haircut though, Bleh, you know, <laughs> and you laugh about it. I'm just trying to hurry up and get us to two hours later, you know, one bottle of wine later to where we can start laughing about it. <laughs> The job is like getting dumped every day. <laughs> Multiple times a day. Yeah. I think also too, it's not necessarily like whenever a bad thing happens in the news, it's not that you're laughing at the event. Like the pandemic itself isn't funny, but there are plenty of sub feelings in there. Like the amount of time we're all spending wiping our groceries is ridiculous. And I feel like that is not the core of the pandemic, but that's a new weird facet of our lives. And I think like, and, or the real feelings that we all have, the weird insecurities that we've developed or, or the, our reactions to each other, or the fact that, man, Zoom happy hours were a lifeline to all of us in April. And now you kind of want to skip them. I'm like, I want to skip you right now. <laughs> I feel like those are like very human things where you're not making fun of the event, but you can you can plug in on the emotional level to like there are certain common feelings that we're all having or that many of us are having, and those are things you can write about without being disrespectful of the event at large. I think those are the ways in for me at least. I don't know, Dina. <laughs> yeah, well, I was gonna say it's like shared feelings, like it's little things like everyone telling you, oh, you should really like work out at home, and it's like, well, what nugget of that can you like take and say like, oh, you should really because you can't really go outside, like, you know, you should work out at home. So like the sketch would be something like, you know, someone making up an excuse that's ridiculous, like of constantly why they can't work out. Well, it's like this time, but then right after breakfast, but then they have to take a shit, but then you can't really do it right after that. You know what I mean? So it's these like little shared experiences, like Jenny said, wiping down the groceries where we can take little nuggets and make them into something versus like the bigger reality. Yeah, I mean, that that's not to say that there are things that we will not touch. And, you know, we've had, there's been enough horrifying days in American history in the last four years that we've foregone even having the monologue during the show because it's just, you know, nobody's asking for a monologue that day. You know, like it's, and, and it's it's Seth and the producer's call if, if, if stuff's getting too real. And, you know, we're trying to pitch a sketch about working out at home <laughs> and, you know, they're just like, time out you know but you know that's that's the call you have to make during a pandemic trying to do a comedy show and like so many other shows you guys have had to pivot to working and broadcasting from home but um i also think necessity is the mother of all inventions so are there ways you think that the show has benefited from these challenges you know aside from you know not having to you know get out of your pajamas amber you love all the equipment they sent you why don't you talk about it <laughs> stuff my house is full of this garbage i gotta set up all this stuff i don't know what this stuff is i don't know how it works and it's all over my house janelle it's <laughs> too much i hate it here my <laughs> house is tiny i live in new york i can't have all this stuff in my house i have a husband he's he up a lot of room more. you can't fit both your husband and the lights it's one or the other too many things in here I feel sad. <laughs> you look great, so it's worth it. It's obviously working. <laughs> it is a lot of equipment. I and I do not see an upside. I want to see my little friends. I want to go into work. I'm tired of this house. It's for all I know, it smells in here. I don't know. I never leave. What if we stink? That's possible. It's full of crap. It's full of equipment I don't know how to use. <laughs> Yeah, are you all anxious to get back in the actual room with each other? I miss us. I mean, once there's a vaccine, yeah. No, <laughs> I, don't need to, I don't need to go tomorrow. No one's, trying to, no one's trying to die to write a monologue joke, but I feel like... <laughs> that actually sounds like a key for one of our monologue jokes, like key, gravestone, died writing monologue. Yeah, yeah. At least, at least no joke I write is worth dying. 
maybe these guys will write some jokes that are worth dying for, but mine are, you know, B minus at best. <laughs> Not to um, uh, keep going back to quote unquote failure, but um, I love this idea of, of jokes or, or sketches that you weren't able to get on. Is there something you're really dying to get on or that maybe you keep slipping back in and uh, you're not fooling anyone? Like they've seen this sketch before or they've heard this joke before. Is, it, is there something that you're like really dying? Uh, go, go ahead and burn it uh, on, on this chat, yeah. <laughs> Last week, I had a monologue joke that I thought was so funny. I just submitted it two days in a row and just pretended like my boss hadn't seen it the second time. It got rejected both times, Janelle. <laughs> Who do I think I'm fooling? Do you want to share it with us or, or save it for a third submission? So bad. It's not even that I want to save it. It's so bad, I'm not going to sully this panel with it. But somebody else should talk. <laughs> Jenny, I think you need to say it. <laughs> It was, there was a setup about how somebody was working on a vaccine. Like there's some countries like blah, 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 good news. Like German scientists have announced that they are already in the trial phase for a Corona vaccine. And then it was like, and so far there's only one small side effect. And then it was a picture of a man with lobster hands. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so bad. Oh, I'm sorry. I just got, I'm sorry. I'm fired. <laughs> two times and then the third then the next day there was another setup about a trial for a, a vaccine and i texted one of our our other friends karen i said do you dare me to send it in a third time i dare you to send it in every day <laughs> until we get to come back yeah. someone, else, someone else should talk about a, a frequently re yes, rejected please product. I just think you're taught like one of the learning lessons is just like not to get attached to anything really like because that you're just never going to win that way so it's like you, you think something is great and you're so excited and you submit it and, and even if it goes well like you can't be too bummed out if you know it doesn't get picked or it doesn't go because you have to like bounce back move on and like get to the next thing uh, I which think is that actually like the beauty of it too because that's just a good learning lesson in life mm -hmm. so I would say one thing we're insulated from in quarantine is um, hearing an audience reaction. Cool. So when we are in the studio, we would have a test audience come in every day and listen to the monologue and the closer look and all the other sketch bits that were going to be in the show that night to hear how they laughed or reacted. And a, a lot lived and died by their reaction. And so now we're spoiled. We don't have to hear a whole audience of strangers like crickets at our jokes and sketches. So now it's really just, oh, the people running the show didn't <laughs> like it um but I don't know there's something about like the live studio energy that just you know I, I I really miss that I can't wait to get back to that for sure I'm just saying if an audience had been there lobster hands would have crushed thank you Janelle. I believe it <laughs> and you understand I'm you. seeing a lot of ha 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 ha's in the chat Jenny so you're right actually I am yeah so you have the virtual approval <laughs> Approval is the one that matters most. <laughs> um, I'm just sort of curious. When you all signed up for the show, did you sign up just as writers, or did you did you know there might be uh, a chance to be appearing on camera? And and what is that like? I mean, I've been with Amber when someone has recognized you and said, you know, it's Amber says what? Like I think they think that's actually your last name. Oh, <laughs> um, but Jenny, like when when you two appear and, and do just. Uh, uh, Jokes Seth can't tell. I know that's really popular too. I know people in New York play it cool, but but do you get stopped much or do you find people recognize you? If I'm by myself, no. If I'm with Amber, you bet. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been with Amber where she wasn't recognized. I like know. Walking Maybe. down the street anywhere, yeah. I love Amber. Well, I think it's, you're right. I think people play it cool in New York, but Amber is so warm and approachable that I think it's less that people like, Feel like they're seeing a celebrity more like they feel like they're seeing their friend which is yeah. really sweet but i think like amber and i do hang out a lot in real life so i think when people see us together i think it makes them laugh because they're like oh yeah just like on my it's just like in my living room <laughs> like, yeah try to catch us apart I have to say to to Jenny's credit, I remember being at an Emmy event with Amber and people weren't approaching her but when you showed up it suddenly clicked and they realized who she was. So I think it works both ways. Oh, that's very generous. 
Um, I actually want to take some questions from, there's a lot, so um, forgive me if I uh, butcher anyone's name. Um, uh, oh, we have someone from Venezuela uh, named Antonio wants to know, <laughs> in the writer's room, when someone else makes your joke better, does that feel good or is it soul crushing? <laughs> it only feels good. We all win when one of us wins. It, but also we're not, I don't know if people are like keeping score and stuff. I think we're all pretty excitable. I think one of my like favorite things is like, I'll send a sketch to Jenny and then I'll pull over my, she'll be like, okay, come I'll pull over my chair. And then I'll just see her like brilliant brain working in real time and just making it infinitely better. And like, it's, it's so cool. I feel like we do, we all do that for each other. I'm yeah. thrilled if I hand something to somebody and it comes back better. I'm not like, I'm, I don't feel down on myself. I feel thrilled that I'm friends with this person who like gave me these better jokes. Are you sort of surprised by the camaraderie? Because you hear so many stories about how cutthroat comedy specifically can be. I, th I think because we're all in the same room, nobody gets away with anything. You know what I'm saying? Like we kind of like, if someone has a problem with someone, you air it out right then and there, everyone takes sides, you fight like siblings and then it's over and we all laugh. I, I would say like, that's the only, that's how we address tension in the room. But Legit. I think it's because the women in the room, like Ali also like don't let like people <laughs> I'm a monster in the room <laughs> no, but, but in a good way so so you know it's like all equal and fair and when it's not someone speaks up it's like we're in a 15-way healthy marriage it's like if somebody <laughs> says something they're having a crummy day and they say something and they're a little sharp there's a little edge in their voice or somebody says something that's a little passive aggressive immediately everybody will turn around and be like what do you mean by that no say what you think okay well if you think that then this is how I feel and blah 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 and it might get tense for a second but just like in a good marriage, like, you know, you work through it and then everybody's at a better place and you have a better understanding and then everybody can relax and move on. And I, and we can laugh about it two days later and be like, remember that weird fight we had? Um, <laughs> but I think you're right. I think like Ali especially does a beautiful job of calling people out, but I think in a way that keeps us all honest and healthy and you don't build grudges and we all genuinely like each other. And I think a lot of characters and bits come out of these bickerings. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, Point Counterpoint came came absolutely out of Amber and Allie joking around and their very real personalities and like their very real reactions to a certain thing that was happening in the news. Allie, Allie. You, you called yourself a monster in the room. It actually sounds like you're a therapist. Well, I just, oh God, what's the appropriate way to say this? Um, <laughs> I don't suffer fools when I feel like somebody's trying to be passive aggressive, especially when it's men. <laughs> um, I just like, I, I don't know, I just like putting people on the spot and being like, what do you mean by that? Like, I know people are maybe G-chatting each other, <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I kind of, I think, I think it's also kind of fun to like poke a bear, you know? <laughs> it's funny, bits always come from it and it's never like malicious. So I want to be clear, I'm not like trying to make people go home crying. <laughs> No, it Although, honestly does make us all get along better. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. It's, oh, it's someone anonymous. I thought their name was actually anonymous attendee. Um, wants to know how much time and effort do you devote daily to keeping up with culture? And what are some of your favorite sources? Zero. I'm just on Twitter goofing around. I would say that is really it. At night, I'll watch local news. That's it. But I'm not trying to sit around watching CNN all day. You could hurt yourself. You can hurt your feelings. It's horrible. When when we're in the room, we like can't avoid it because it's on mute. But there is a, a huge TV uh, or two uh, in the room, so like you know, everyone's constantly kind of keeping one eye on it. So it's a little bit less depressing actually not having that now. I do find that Twitter is like pretty much where I get all my news these days. Um, it gets there first, you know, uh, and, and you know, what's the other option? I don't know. Do you watch Fox News at all to find out what they're saying? <laughs> Those expressions said it all. <laughs> um, we have a question from Brian who wants to know, oh, did you have any teachers in school who were either intentional or unintentional in comedic attempts? I thought this was gonna be a question about teachers who inspired you, but I guess he's actually asking if uh, <laughs> there were some that, that gave you material. Parody of both teachers. 
<laughs> no. Yes. Well, look, there are lots of silly, goofy teachers. I mean, but never a specific, good, splashy personality. Those are all church people and neighbors, right? <laughs> Well, actually, I'm, I am curious about um, who were the people who, you know, really encouraged you or, or, or even mentored you uh, coming up in comedy? I think I um, would visit Chicago. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and we would visit Chicago to do the Chicago Improv Festival. Oh, my gosh, the capital of improv. We'd go there and... Um, people would say, you know, you're doing a good job. This is good. You could have a job in this. You could find a improv job and like m make a living. And it was that it was Sharna Halpern, the lady who runs, ran, runs, mm -hmm, uh, IO in Chicago, who was first like, you need to take this goofy thing seriously. And then she did whatever she could to help me and got me internship, blah, blah, blah. So that, that's really cool. <laughs> Anyone else? I think absolutely no one encouraged me, which made me want to do it even more. Like I was like, oh, this is a sign. <laughs> What's the one thing nobody wants me to do? I'm going to do it. <laughs> when I was in, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you, please. I was going to say when I was in college in my little improv group, I had like kind of just started to get the idea that maybe this was a job people could have. And we went to an improv festival, and at the improv festival, the Upright Citizens Brigade folks were teaching a workshop. And they had just gotten their Comedy Central show, but it hadn't started airing yet. And I took this workshop that Amy Poehler taught. And then on the break, I, like, got all my courage up and, like, asked her a couple nerdy questions about, um, I was like, well, I heard that maybe you could, in Chicago, there's classes you could take. And I was wondering, and she was, like, so cool. I was, and I was such a nerd and she was like who's thinking about going to Chicago and I was like me and my friend and, my, and she goes huh yeah you should go and it's so dumb but it's like having another person who seems like a grown-up saying you can do this mm -hmm. and then later on I think the next day at the festival I was walking around and she tapped me on the shoulder and she goes hey I have this for you and it was a paper brochure for the improv olympic and again this is like pre-google and stuff so like that brochure was like gold because I don't, where else would I have found that information? Like there was no internet. Like, I don't know, like what was I gonna call 411 in Chicago and be like, can you connect me to improv? <laughs> and so I just feel like it was like the most generous act for her to take a second and, and make that effort. And I feel like it, it really, it just makes a big difference. I think when you're younger, probably when you're aspiring to do anything that you don't know people who do it, when you don't know somebody who does it, to have somebody look you in the eye and say, you can do this. This is a thing you can do. I mean, if Amy Poehler had been rude, imagine where you might be now. I'd be a dental assistant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question from Megan, uh, wants to know, oh, what's something you wish you knew about working in comedy when you were at the start of your career? Mm, I probably, I started at Funny or Die as a producer and I really wanted to get hired as a writer. And I was given a lot of excuses as why I wasn't being transferred to a writer, even though I would like submit sketches and do stuff on the side. And I think like, looking back, I wish I had asked for what I wanted more directly. Um, and just sort of like, I don't know, just been more of a champion of myself because I feel like you can get lost in the wings very easily because there's a lot of people who are go-getters. Go and I think like my career wouldn't have started in my mid thirties if I had just been more of my own champion in my twenties and, you know, demanded a chance um, after I put in the work, you know? So I think that would be, have a little more confidence in myself, I guess would be my advice to my younger self. It's weirdly hard to advocate for ourselves. I think, I mean, even, even out of my twenties, I find it challenging. Yeah, it's so strange how your condition to never do it. I think when I got to this job, I saw Michelle Wolf freaking acting crazy. Michelle doesn't give two rips and she says exactly what she wants and she gets it and it's crazy. And I, I, I 
I'm much older than Michelle. And when I got this job and I saw her acting that way, I thought, we can act that way? <laughs> and then I started doing it. And now I'm like that. And now all these people are like that because Michelle d does whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to like dump on men here, but the approach that men and women take <laughs> Jenny's breaking up is so important. We talk a lot about this in the writer's room, like even someone reaching out for advice or anything, a lot of times you get from the women like, oh, I don't know if this is good, but maybe like you might like take a, like a chance and maybe even talk to me. Like it's very deferential and just very different, the approach. And then like a lot of times, just in my experience, and I can only speak for mine, um, but I know we've talked about this before. It's like a lot of times you get it um, from men. They're like, so how do I get your job? Like, what did you do? Cause I'm going to do that too kind of thing. So I think like, it's so encouraging being in the room because I feel like, um, I feel encouraged like to advocate for myself more and more. And I have always found that difficult to do. Like I'll do it, but like to a certain extent. Um, so I find it very encouraging, but it is very funny. Like the different approaches that, <laughs> that we take. Um, Cause I think we're just conditioned that way, but I feel like we're getting out of it. So that's good. I think it's one of the nice things about being in a writer's room that has so many women in it is that I think women are often not encouraged to be direct, to advocate for themselves, to be direct communicators. And if you're the, I mean, I think, again, I don't want to stereotype either, but I think often in situations where you're the only woman in a room, if you want to communicate that way, it can be received negatively. But if you're communicating that way and there's four or five other women that you can see who are a foot away from you and they're all nodding along like, yeah, you're behaving normally. And other people take a cue from them and act as if you were behaving normally. And so I think like that is, there are obviously a million reasons why you want to have um, a balance uh, of genders in a uh, writer's room. Like you want to have a balanced and, and, and integrated and diverse writer's room, but that's one of the benefits is that I, I feel like I can be my own normal assertive self because there are other women who are like, yeah, what she said. Uh, I have some quick questions I want to burn through, or, or maybe they're not quick. I saw one, um, uh, Jenny, someone who has curly hair really wants to know what hair care products you use. <laughs> <laughs> If you will take another question, I will go get them and show you. I'll All right. Um, well, let's take a question from Craigor. Uh, comedy is sometimes plagued by burnout and depression, um, including the loss of amazing writers, comics, and performers. How do you personally recharge or practice self-care to keep healthy and productive? I don't. I'm terrible. And I only ever work and I never take a break. And one day, this is going to catch up with me. That's how you were, yeah. And for showing you. Yeah, you gotta be careful not to drink an entire bottle of red wine at night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you have lives outside of, of work. I mean, what, yeah, come on, you do to some extent. I have <laughs> <other> jobs. <laughs> So what are the things that, especially during quarantine, are there, there things you've been watching or reading or, you know, that have uh, uh, kept you, helped keep you creative? Yeah, I consume a butt ton of television. I want to watch all of it. I just want to know what people are doing out there. I watch a lot of bad reality TV as an estate. I her reality TV. She can, she can watch Like it. Married at First Sight, Love is Blind, Married Without Having Smelled the Person. Like if they make <laughs> show about blind marriage like I'm all in <laughs> did you watch the show about people who are dating and autistic yes um I'm three episodes in I saw the whole thing right yes and I see some comments I watched all of Indian matchmaking in one day <laughs> I'm actually going through Netflix too fast they're not churning out shows fast enough <laughs> that's on them it's not necessarily reality, but have you watched Floor is Lava? Yeah, 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 of course. Oh, it's just such lovely comfort viewing. Yeah. And everyone thinks they'd do good on those courses, and I'm telling you, most people wouldn't. <laughs> I love how the person falls in the lava, and then they just cut away, and they, like, slip under the lava, and then the family's like, they're dead, bye. Like, they don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah they recover quickly. Um, Jenny, did you get your products? Yes, I did. All right. I'm only doing this because I feel for other curly hair people and I have asked other people and I get this question a lot. All right, the first thing, this is made by Shea Moisture. It is coconut and hibiscus frizz-free curl mousse. I put uh, this 
all over. Then you gotta do this first. I put this all over. And then you're gonna do a thin layer of Paul Mitchell Firm Style Super Clean Sculpting Gel. I use that too. Great. See, so you know, but you can't go heavy on this because you will end up with crunchy hair. So this is like a little like a top glaze just to make the curls form themselves. You mostly are going to rely on this magic elixir. So this first and then this. If you want to take a screenshot, there you go. Now's your chance. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you get a cut from the sales. I was going to say, yeah. I would, yeah, it's so funny. I would never want to be in a commercial except I would happily endorse these two products until I die. <laughs> I literally uh, somebody just wrote, thank you. <laughs> no, really good, good practical advice. Uh, we have a question from Claire. Oh, wants to know if you've ever had the unfortunate experience of someone stealing your joke and taking credit for it. Not necessarily in, in the writer's room, but you know, if you've been in comedy, it's probably happened. This is what I would love to say. No one's out there friggin' looking for your shitty jokes. That I don't think, I think 99% of the time, people just so happen to have thought of the same joke as you. Uh, it, it's so rare for someone in today, now in this age, to be searching for jokes and stealing jokes because we have so many receipts you would be a fool. And lots of people are like, oh my gosh, can you believe this show stole my tweet from 1999? No, no one did that. No one's, look, no one's doing that. Also, it feels really good when you write a joke and it's on television and you wrote it. That feels good. Stealing someone else's stuff and putting it on TV doesn't feel like anything. That's how I feel. We are, we are paid to have Seth steal our jokes every night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kate wants to know, <laughs> who is in favor of keeping the sea captain and who hates him? I love it. Yeah, I think anything that gets us to a silly place in these weird messed up times is great. Yeah, I think Seth needs some companionship there. So if the sea captain is providing that, that's all we can ask. <laughs> um, we have a lot of questions from people just sort of looking to break in and, and they're sort of curious if, you know, there was some way that you got your pack, if you submitted a packet, if there was some way that you felt it stood out or, you know, just sort of how they go from where they are to, to sort of break into the industry. I don't know if anyone has any good advice on that. I feel like if I, it's, it's a, if I could offer, I know I'm, so I don't mean to talk so much. I feel like, um, but if I could offer it, I submitted 35 late night packets before I got hired. So I feel especially qualified to answer this one. Um, <clears throat> and I feel like it can be so frustrating and it can feel like putting all this work into something and then dropping it down a well and not hearing. But I'll say two things. One is that the exercise of writing the packets will make you better. So I feel like at the very least, I know it's so frustrating and it sucks, but when I've got like one time a little while after I got hired, I went back and looked at some of them and I can see now with like some distance, I can see each one getting better. So the practice of writing them, like even if you feel like you gain nothing from a submission process, I promise you that submission that you wrote got you a step closer. It got you better, sharper. It's like going to the gym, it made your muscles like stronger for the next time. But the other thing is I think like, I spent a lot of time in the beginning trying to make my packets match exactly the voice of the host. And I think I focused too much on that. And I think if you can find a way to make your packet be an intersection of the voice of the host and your voice, that's the money. I think that's, I think for a while I was like erasing myself out of them and trying to sound like a copy of whatever host I was applying to instead of letting my personality come through. So I think that's, that's a goal to, to shoot for is how can you show that you get what the voice of the show is, but how can you bring yourself into it and let yourself shine? Were you, um, just out of curiosity, were you blindly submitting or did you have an agent submitting for you? I would just throw them out my window, Janelle. I well, one cook. I one. <laughs> I one. Oh, Amber was walking under my, um, no, I would um, find out about shows that were submitting and reach out to them and ask, how can I submit? Or I'd have a friend who knew about the submission information and knew I wanted to submit and would let, you know, generously share the information. I didn't have an agent. So I would just hear about it in the comedy community or from a friend who worked on the show and would say, hey, do you want to submit? 
And for people who want to practice and learn that process, when a show is soliciting submissions, they send you a PDF of what they're looking for and a description. So it's sort of like an outline of what they're looking for from you. So it's not like you're just sitting down at a computer at a blank page and, you know, figuring out what to submit. The show tells you what they are looking for. Uh, we have a question from Sarah. Oh, wants to know about Amber's upcoming show on Peacock. Um, is there anything you're excited to do on the show you haven't been able to do on Seth Meyers? Or, uh, and also, are you going to be able to keep doing both shows? We're going to do both shows. Jenny is the head writer. I'm the lady who's going to host it. <laughs> we have done nothing so yeah. far. The show starts, I don't think I'm allowed to say, but soon <laughs> we haven't done anything. <laughs> so, I mean, the show will be very topical and we'll do it every Friday. Um, so we won't have, you know, I want so desperately to write it all now and be prepared, but you can't. It has to be topical. So we're just waiting. But I do have a lot of old things that I would love to submit to myself and see if I would put them on the show. Amber, do you think there's room for a joke about um, <laughs> Please. the inaugural joke of the Amber Ruffin show? Well, that's <laughs> it. I humbly submit. <laughs> I think you should just do the whole show in lobster hands as a subtle nod to, to the genius of that sketch. <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank everyone uh, so much for being such a great audience and joining us at home. Um, congratulations on all the success. It's been a particularly wonderful season. Thank you for keeping us laughing um, during these times. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us. Having us. Thank you, ladies. And thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in. Yay.